Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Idea Center's Masterclass on Innovation and Creativity. Now, what we're hoping to do here is share with you a whole range of approaches that come under the general banner headline of This Stuff Works. This isn't about theory, um, although some of the underpinning theory will be explained within the process. But this is very much uh, an approach that's derived from an experiential point of view. Uh, we've been using this material over the last 25 plus years in a range of different organizations in different sectors. And in fact, it's actually born out of uh, the embedding within a range of different organizations that I held various leadership positions for. Um, and hopefully we'll give you a fresh insight into how you can then seize control of the creativity process within your organization and then embed approaches to innovation that will drive um, the process at will, quite frankly. Um, but first, I need to give you some background. Let me explain a bit about where I come from to hopefully put this stuff in context. Um, some years ago, the early 1990s, I was manufacturing director for an organization that made safety systems for petrochemical installations. Um, whenever anything goes wrong in a petrochemical installation, whether it's off offshore or onshore, you want to take the human intervention out of it. You want to automatically shut the system down on a very safe basis. And these are very complicated systems. No two installations are the same, so everything is different. Um, I was manufacturing director for one of these organizations, uh, and a typical safety system would take anywhere between, just put this in context, 60 and 80,000 man hours to assemble a unit on the shop floor. And within test, it would take anywhere between 20 and 30,000 man hours. So these were big systems, very complicated electronic and electrical systems, combinations of the two. And my role as the manufacturing director, as far as I could see when I inherited the role in the early 1990s, was to turn up at board meetings on a monthly basis and regularly get beaten up, quite frankly. Um, because sure as eggs were eggs, um, what I inherited was a, a situation where manufacturing on every single contract, recognizing everything was one off, would always overrun. And when I say overrun, we'd overrun by a minimum of 25% of the allocated budget. Um, if ever anything went wrong in engineering and design, we would find it on the shop floor and we'd therefore overrun budgets. And so I'd tip up every month and get beaten up at board meetings. And now, at the time, I was um, kind of fresh to leadership roles, senior management roles in organizations, and I was doing some management training. I did two courses. I did one course on manufacturing management, uh, which felt right as a manufacturing director. But in parallel with that, someone had tipped me off and said, there's a very easy option here. It's kind of a weird course called creative management. And it's, it's, you get the CPD credits, and so it's worth doing. And quite frankly, it's weird. But if you can tolerate the, the strangeness of it all, you can put it down and drop it at the end, and you never play with it again. Um, and it's quite straightforward. You just kind of bolster it. And ideal for doing in parallel with a serious course like manufacturing management. Um, so I did this um, manufacturing management course, dull as dishwater, quite frankly, Dickensian in its nature, old fashioned, out of date, inappropriate. The creative management course, however, was absolutely stunning. Um, I uh, halfway through, I had to do an assignment. And so I got a group of the guys that worked for me together. And I said, look, do me a favor. This is kind of weird stuff. I want to share with you some odd techniques. Uh, but late one Friday afternoon, when everyone else has gone home, if you're going to sit in the boardroom and we'll have a play with these techniques, and I'll write up, I'll, I'll facilitate it, and I'll write up the experience, and I'll get uh, my assignment done. And quite frankly, you need never worry about it again. But at the end of the session, we, we kind of sat there open mouthed, quite frankly, um, recognizing that what we'd just been playing with were a range of techniques that could completely restructure the thinking process to challenge convention and tradition. Things that we'd always done before all of a sudden were being questioned in a very structured way. And we were amazed at what the outcome was. We generated a whole series of step changes that we went away and played with in the manufacturing environment and started to have an effect. So much so that we started having regular meetings on Friday afternoons to drive more and more of these ideas. And over a period of two years, directly, as a result of this creativity approach, challenging conventional and traditional thinking and going away and implementing stuff, we transformed the situation from overrunning budgets by a minimum of 25% to undercutting budgets on exactly the same calculation by a minimum of 15% on every single contract. Now, when that kind of stuff works, why wouldn't you spread it across the rest of the organization, which is what we did at Commensurate. Actually, it was kind of in parallel. We were actually floating the company and becoming a PLC. We transformed the approach and what we called team culture, uh, which was all about challenging the way we did things across the entire organization. Now, why wouldn't you take those techniques wherever you go? And I went from uh, here, I went from the oil and gas sector into contract electronics. I ran an organization in Essex, chief exec, an organization that assembled printed circuit boards for other people. 
Uh, they did the design work, we do the assembly. We used to make all the old Acorn PCs, anything that goes ping in a hospital. Chances are we've made something like it, if not that directly. Um, so that's what we did. Um, and we started embedding the creative approaches. And so powerful was it that we started offering it to our clients. Contract electronics is a tough industry. You make very low margins. 2% is a good return on sales in any year. Sneeze and you lose money. We needed a differentiator that would command a higher price. And the creativity we started offering to our clients transformed our business development approach. We gave it them for free. Absolutely confident that no other contract research organization in the land was going to offer this kind of service for the clients. I went on from there into a very different sector. I went into forensic sciences. Uh, I ran the horse racing forensic laboratory uh, since 2001 through 2010, so best part of 10 years. This was a curious organization when I joined it. It was basically the laboratory in the United Kingdom that does all the drug testing for British horse racing. It does 100% of the horse racing in the UK, had kind of a monopoly position. It was owned by um, British horse racing. It was actually owned by government Quango, the horse race betting levy board. We also did 100% of the greyhound testing in the UK. So if an animal races anywhere in the UK, we do the testing for it. Um, when I arrived, sat in the public sector, run by a government Quango. Uh, this is an organization that was 38 years old, and it had lost money every single month for 38 years. Um, it was under no financial pressures whatsoever. If ever it lost money in a month, all it had to do was to invoice the Quango that was effectively part of the banker for British horse racing. Um, and all it had to do was to invoice that the Quango for that loss at the end of every month, and hey, presto, it looked like it broke even. This was the closest thing I've come across to a country club culture. A bunch of people, were, forensic scientists, civil servants, would turn up for work every day and do an interesting day science, go home. Repeat, 365 days a year. Uh, no commercial pressures whatsoever, no need for marketing. Um, it was a monopoly position. Um, when I joined it as the chief exec, I was only the fourth ever chief exec of that organization. It tells you everything you need to know. And I was the first chief exec that was not the best forensic scientist in town. Um, it used to be the case that every decision would cascade upwards towards the chief exec. They'd make the decision and cascade it back down again because they were the expert. Absolutely couldn't be the case with me. My brief, with a fresh pair of eyes, if you like, was to come in and turn it round, to move it from uh, deficit into surplus. And we did it in less than six months. Within six months, we became profitable. At the end of the first year, we paid staff the first bonus they'd ever had. At the end of every subsequent year, we paid increasing levels of bonuses. We became embarrassingly profitable for British horse racing and as a government quango owning this organization within five or six years. So we privatized and then sold again in 2010, which is when I narrowly missed a management buyout, which then led me to setting up my own organization called the Idea Center. Now, you cannot change the culture in six months, but you can change the climate. And all we had to do to transform the organization was to unlock the way people were thinking. If you treat yourself as a loss-making organization, don't be surprised that you are forever a loss-making organization. What we had to do was to unlock conventional and traditional thinking, release the potential. You can do that quickly. You embed it over a slower period of time, or a longer period of time. But therein lies true transformation, which is what we did. So, as I said at the beginning, this stuff works. What I'm sharing with you is born out of experience. There's a group of us now that help organizations understand these approaches and help them embed them in their organization to do them for yourselves. So this is what we're going to be sharing. So key background material. I've worked in a range of different organizations, as, as you all have, I have no doubt, and, and kind of a universal constant, regardless of the type of the organization, regardless of the sector, regardless of whether it's public sector, private sector, third sector, charity, we do a lot with hospices, we do a lot with small organizations all the way through to the larger the car corporates. One thing we know in any of these organizations, the world around us is changing at an exponential rate. There is an explosion of stuff happening out there. Uh, and, and the rate of change fuels the rate of change. So this is good news. Because what it means is if you're an entrepreneur, if you're uh, innovative, if you're creative, there's an ever exploding world of opportunity out there, a world of what might be. This is an exploding universe of opportunity, or world of what might be, that all we have to do is to look at what's happening out there. You've got to assume at any moment in time, there's something happening somewhere in the world that if only you knew about it, could have a transformative effect on the way you do things in your business, whether externally selling, design work, or whatever it might, management systems. All we have to do is grab hold of it, and woof, we're off on our next innovation journey. This is good news. However, we as individuals 
and collectively as cultures, we can't keep up with this rate of change. This rate of change is too damn fast. Uh, we don't have the mental capacity. In fact, we're kind of flawed. We're for high functioning uh, individuals as human beings, but we're flawed if you like, because fundamentally we make sense of our worlds by looking backwards. Um, it's a particular trait. If we're going to make a decision on what to do next, if we're going to try and solve a problem, the start point has to be, if you think about it, by definition, the process of looking back at what's happened before. You look back at past experience, knowledge, training, understanding, stuff that's happened in your past. Based on that, you decide today how you're going to behave in the future. So you look at the past, you look at today, and then you project into the future. Your behavior is determined by that backward-looking perspective. Now, we're good because we can learn off each other. And if you've got a group of people in the room, uh, we can improve over time, but we improve at this much slower rate because with a group, we can learn off each other at that moment in time. We can compare our collective pasts. So we'll share our pasts, which are all slightly different, and we can learn off each other, and therefore we can improve. And what we do is we look back collectively, then decide today collectively how we're going to behave in the future, collectively. And so we improve, but we improve at a much, much slower rate. And effectively, we get trapped in our own world of what is, which is based within an organization on that accumulative past or history. And the, the world in which we get trapped is a beautifully well-behaved world because this is based on incremental change. I mean, there's no big surprises in this world. We do things better, but it's always based on what's happened and worked before. So we nudge things forward. There are no big surprises in here. And we get surrounded and trapped in this by uh, an environment or a, a, an atmosphere of conventional and traditional thinking. And that's how we operate. And every organization in the land is trapped in their world of what is. Every decision they ever make is made through the prism of this world of what is. And fundamentally, we can't break out of this because it's absolutely fundamental to the way we work. And every decision we make is then consistent with that. We would love to break free. We would love to escape this entrapment, this, this, this atmosphere of conventional and traditional thinking. And we do it. We say, we need to think about things differently. We need to do things differently. We need to innovate. Um, and we tell people, we tell people, you should think differently. But we're doing it whilst being trapped, which is almost impossible. And whilst we might like to get out, the problem is we have a series of mental blocks in place. And this isn't about people being awkward or being ill-resourced or ill-equipped or, or reluctant or there's inertia. We're trapped because we have mental blocks. The outer reaches of that atmosphere are, are constrained by things that are almost hardwired in our DNA. We've learned over time not to do anything outrageous. Used to be in days of old, if you do anything outrageous, for goodness sake, you could lose your life. Now, things have moved on. It's not quite like that anymore. But nevertheless, we have ingrained within our DNA the urge to keep one foot in safety as we start to explore a new world. That world of incremental improvement is hardwired and our approach is hardwired. So you can never ever make these mental blocks go away. But if you know that they're there and you understand them, recognizing you can't make them go away, you can then choose to use techniques that will allow you to overcome them. And in short, that's what we're going to be doing in this webinar. What I want to do is to share with you an understanding of where those blocks come from and then introduce you to techniques which are unusual techniques that will allow you to overcome them. And that's where we're going to go with this stuff. Now, people often get confused uh, between this and continuous improvement, and people often misunderstand what we're saying, uh, in some way decrying the world of continuous improvement, because this approach is different. Um, however, I want to be crystal clear that this approach to driving creativity and innovation sits beautifully alongside continuous improvement. This sits alongside, this is complementary. We want to do both approaches. The traditional approach to continuous improvement is basically asking everyone in the organization to look at what they do. And, and whether you call it continuous improvement, uh, Lean Six Sigma, uh, Kaizen, if you want to get fancy with it. Uh, in my day, in the early 1980s, when I came across this for the first time in manufacturing industry, this was referred to as total quality or total quality management, but it's all kind of broadly the same area there. What we do is ask everyone to look at what they do inside the organization. And it doesn't matter how small the incremental change is, if anyone can identify a way of doing things better, and you do enough of those over time, you can start to transform the organization on a cumulative, incremental basis. And this is great stuff. And, and there are two key characteristics. One is it's all about doing things better. Better is the key word here. Um, and the other thing is it's classified typically as being bottom up because you treat everyone as an expert in what they do 
asking them to identify ways in which they can do things better. So this, this uh, gradual increase uh, improvement over time here is based on many, many, many small increments from across the entire organization. It's hugely effective, and that's what continuous improvement is all about. Um, now, that's neat, but because it's about doing things better, because the emphasis is on the word better, this is pointing at the world in which you're trapped. Uh, and if you go back to the previous slide, let me go back to the previous slide here, Basically, what we're doing is talking about making this world in which we're trapped the best world we possibly can. Um, and the incremental continuous improvement curve is remarkably similar to this curve here, in fact. You know what? It's identical to it. This is the continuous improvement curve. And if you're good at continuous improvement, you have a steeper curve, but you will never get above these mental blocks here because these mental blocks here represent a hard stop on the thinking. That's as good as this world is going to get. And our approach is quite different here because... Continuous improvement is great, but from time to time, what we want to do is to superimpose on top of that a step change. What we want to do is take continuous improvement and every now and then at a point of your choosing, then we can decide that in an area of your choosing, we will introduce a step change. But to do it, and this isn't continuous improvement, this is discontinuous improvement. This isn't a being based on the world in which you're trapped and making it better. This is making it different. This is getting rid of that world and saying, no, 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 maybe there's a completely different business model that we can implement here or an approach that we'd never thought of before. Break free from tradition and, and convention and do something very different. And that's what the step change is all about. And the step change here is fundamentally about doing things differently. It is not doing things better. It is doing things differently. And because it's doing things differently, it takes leadership skills to make it change because people become embedded in the way we did things in the past. And what we need to do is to recognize that this needs to be driven top down. This is a top level management responsibility to be accountable for driving step changes. Many organizations that we talk to say, yeah, yeah, we've got an approach to innovation. And our approach to innovation is based on an improvement scheme or a suggestion scheme. We're just waiting for people, fingers crossed, fingers crossed that someone will come up with a great breakthrough idea. All you're gonna do there is come up with a slightly bigger incremental change here. That's what suggestion schemes are for, bottom up. Top down, it's a management responsibility to identify, no, no, we, this area is our selected target area for step change. We need lots of incremental changes. We need one step change every now and then, relatively few. You choose where they are. Uh, and that's where we're gonna break the model. But to do it, we need some special techniques because continuous improvement techniques will not work because their continuous improvement te techniques fundamentally are based around the continuous improvement, uh, doing, th doing things better mentality. And that's what we're looking to challenge. So hopefully this makes sense. Now, simple agenda, uh, two elements to it. I've talked about it already. We're going to identify the blocks to creativity and then we'll look at techniques to overcome those blocks. Simple as that. You will notice there's a big gap in the agenda here because there's some connective tissue that we need to worry about. I can talk about the blocks and then talk about the techniques, but you will think I'm crazy. Uh, some of the techniques are very odd, very unusual, and demand a very, very different mentality. Um, and we need to understand uh, something about the way that children think about problem solving. Children innately are fantastically creative. Um, as they grow up, they lose that creativity, and I'll talk about this and explain it a bit later. Uh, but as young children grow up, they progressively lose the creativity until they reach adulthood, and then they're like us. And we're not very good at all at the creative process. What we need to do is to learn from children. And people get freaked out by this. There are many people who confuse um, childish thinking for what I'm going to be talking about, which is childlike thinking. And it's not childish, it's not frivolous, this is serious creativity. We need fundamentally to understand what makes children so good at creativity, we need to pinch from it and start incorporating it in our problem solving processes. And the techniques demand a degree of playfulness within the process. And so the missing piece here is playfulness. So what we need to do is to understand this. So I'm going to explain that as well. So hopefully this is all making sense. Don't be freaked out by the fact we're gonna think like children in order to make these techniques work. This is done selfishly to drive the step change process. So bear with us on this. Two key definitions. Uh, we talk to lots of organizations about this and two words come up on a regular basis. Uh, first of those is, is innovation, doing them backwards actually. Um, innovation is uh, hugely, I, I don't reckon there's an organization anywhere in the land now that does not claim to be innovative. 
every organization claims to be innovative. They go, yeah, yeah, we're definitely an innovative organization, for goodness sake. It's in our mission statement. That's how innovative we are. It's in our values. One of our values is innovation. How cool is this? Um, so clearly, these are innovative organizations. Um, I was talking to an organization recently, a manufacturing company, that said, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, dev we're so innovative. We have it in everyone's personal objectives to be innovative, to be more innovative this year. It's in everyone's personal objective, just to make sure people get the message. Now, this is interesting, because this is an issue of definitions. Uh, if that ever happens, if you come across it, um, I reckon any organization that is genuinely, um, has innovation at its heart, any two people in the business should give you the same definition of the word innovation. And I am yet to find an organization that can achieve that goal. Uh, many people will blabber, are you talking to an innovation director? Um, there are organizations have innovation directors. If you ask the question, what do you mean by innovation? There's some blabbering around the place, and after about 15 minutes, they kind of come up with a definition, but it's one that no one else would stand a chance of replicating. This is not good enough inside an organization that reckons to be innovative. Creativity freaks people out. People know they ought to be creative. They're learning the words, but they don't know what to do with it. And it's often seen as being pink and fluffy and odd and a bit strange and therefore not ready for us. What they often say is, yeah, we've got somebody in marketing who's a bit creative, or we use an agency to do the creative thing for us. But, but we're an innovative company. We're kind of that macho thing. We're innovators, uh, which is the doing thing. The creativity thing, airy-fairy. We've got access to it, but we don't do this. And this isn't good enough. Um, I'm going to give you two very, very simple definitions here uh, that start to put a completely different complexion around these two key words. And the first is the definition of the word creativity. Creativity is simply the process of generating ideas which are both novel and useful. That's key. We want the combination of novelty and usefulness. It is not creative to generate an idea that is simply useful, but that is useful. And useful ideas drive the continuous improvement process. So if all you want is continuous improvement, not a problem. Stay with useful ideas. We are all, as adults, hugely skilled at generating useful ideas. Uh, we're good at it, but it is not what creativity is about. It is equally not creative to generate a novel idea that's useless. So if you've got a novel idea that's useless, I mean, by definition, that's going to be useless. But what I want to do is to persuade you that the vast majority of creative problem-solving techniques are a two-stage process. What we need to do is to learn to suspend judgment. We need to recognize this two-stage process. Um, we have an issue here because useful kills novelty. If we have a useful idea, it flushes out any hope of ever getting novel anywhere near it. Useful kills novel. The first stage of any creative technique, worth its salt, is to generate a novel idea that would definitely, definitely, definitely solve the problem if only it were useful. So it's novel and useless. It definitely would solve the problem if only it were possible. Now, by definition, that's going to be a bonkers, crackers, crazy idea out of this world. Uh, ridiculous. But who cares? As long as it's novel, hadn't thought of that before, uh, and useless, not practical, therefore you've been liberated, and it definitely would solve the problem. That is stage one. Stage two is then to grab hold of that novelty and don't let it go, understand why it works, and then do what we're good at, which is to find a useful idea of delivering the same effect. Bingo, you've got a novel and useful idea. But you've used the novelty as kind of the stalking horse to give you the attributes of a useful idea that will be truly creative. Every creative problem-solving technique, two-stage process. Stage one, generate an idea that's novel and useless. You cannot do it the other way around. Um, useful kills novel. So if you've got useful on the table, you will, every fiber of your being will reject any hope of ever getting novelty anywhere near it. So you're condemning yourself to useful. And if you want step change, you have to have novel. This is something you'd never thought about before. It's as simple as that. Don't get high and mighty over novelty and the definition of it. Novelty is simply something you hadn't thought of before, whether as an individual or across the organization. Simple as that. Stage two, grab the novelty, don't let it go. Understand the characteristics of it, what makes it work, then do what we're good at, find a useful way of delivering the same effect. Bingo, creative idea. Now, this was a game changer. When I first came across this definition, this was great stuff because I got this pink and fluffy image of creativity and all the baggage that comes with that. 
And actually, this definition is completely different. In my forensic science days, when I arrived, we had 100 forensic scientists in the laboratory. And if I'd walked in there and said, well, Commander, where are all you creative types? You've raised eyebrows and jazz hands, it normally brings them out of the woodwork. Um, you get a deafening silence. This was a um, civil servant forensic scientist based organization. We had a process, we had two and a half thousand standard operating procedures. We only did one thing we looked for drugs in blood and urine. Now, we could follow a process. Creativity? No, no, no. We need serious uh, forensic scientists here. Now, turn it around from my perspective. I was the chief exec. We'd lost money every single year for 38 years. How many members of staff would I want that can generate ideas that are novel, we haven't thought of that before, and useful, we should be doing something with it? Well, for goodness sake, why wouldn't I want everyone in the organization to do that? This creativity thing isn't about having one or two specialist individuals. It's about the culture of an organization. And that was the penny dropping moment for me. And ever since then, wherever I've gone, whenever I've run companies, what we've done is we've had a, an induction process into creativity for anyone who joins the company and we catch everyone up with some training programs in-house to make sure everyone understands the role and then put mechanisms in place for embedding it. And that's the key. This is about a culture. And the, def the sister definition of innovation is equally simple. Innovation is simply the process of making money or adding value out of creativity. Um, it's about take, it's the doing thing. It's take the idea and implement it in such a way that it enhances the bottom line. That gives you the step function change. Um, if you take a novel and useful idea and do nothing with it, you've done the creative bit, but not the innovation bit. And that's actually a waste of time, unless your business is selling ideas, of course. Um, if you take a useful idea that's not novel and implement it to enhance the bottom line, great, that's your day job. Traditionally, that's the continuous improvement process, but it is not innovation. Innovation takes novelty and usefulness, usefulness implemented to enhance the bottom line performance. And if you're in the voluntary sector or the third sector, call it what you will, um, public sector, don't get freaked out by the phrase making money. This is about making your money go, go further. Every single organization wants more, wants to be able to do more with their money, to generate more money and to use it more efficiently. That's what we're talking about here. So adding value may be a different and easier way of looking at it, but basically it's enhancing the financial performance of the organization. Two really simple definitions. And once you've got those in place, they provide a platform to drive the rest of the understanding. So let us have a look at these blockages that we've been talking about. Um, there are two blockages that I want to share with you. And these blockages are all to do with what happens inside the brain. I've said before, you can't make these blockages go away. But if you understand that they're there, you can choose to use techniques that will allow you to overcome them. Um, so we've got thinking process and patterning systems. The easiest thing to do is take each one to time. So let's start from the top and take the thinking process. Now, there's loads of stuff that's been written about this. If you look at everything that's ever been written and kind of imagine you print it all off the computer or you buy all the books and get all the papers, all the, all the, um, the, the esteemed articles and the journals, and you bring them all together, put them in a big pile, stand far enough back and kind of squint your eyes so it blurs a bit, crudely breaks into two halves, referred to as first stage thinking and second stage thinking. And the, the block that we all suffer from, particularly as adults, is that we are massively, massively conditioned to this thing called second stage thinking. Um, from a very early age, we start getting taught how to do second stage thinking, and then we exercise it all the way through our development years and then into industry or, or as we move into careers in organizations. And we are rewarded even through that, all the, all the promotions are, are rewarding really effective second stage thinking. So much so that we almost neglect first stage thinking completely. So let's forget about that for a second. Just concentrate on second stage thinking. Let me explain what this is about. Second stage thinking is simply defined as the process that involves taking information, processing that information, and generating an outcome. It's as simple as that. You take information, you process the information, you generate an outcome. So you imagine, at the end of this webinar, you go back and you bump into a colleague and you say, well, I'm not sure what you've been doing for the last hour, but uh, haven't you heard, we've got a real problem. Uh, let me tell you about it. Let me share you this problem. And what they start doing is giving you information. And as soon as they give you the information, you cock an ear because you're interested, obviously, and you start processing the information. And the more information you're given, the more processing you do. And you're all the way through until you've got all the information that, you, that is to be given. Then what you do is you tell uh, you sit there and consider it, and you say to the, the other person, you say, well, this is what we need to do then. You've taken the information, you've processed it, you've generated an outcome. You know what to do because we're good at this process of second stage thinking. If you think about it, I was okay as a scientist at school because I learned early on, if, if you sit in front of a physics paper, 
provided you revise your equations, all you have to do is match the equation to the paper. Uh, look at the information provided in the question, take it out, drop it into the equation, process it, out comes the answer. Pure second stage thinking. Take the information, process it, generate an outcome. Every exam you have ever taken in your life is simply a test of your ability to do second stage thinking. And if you're good at exams, you go on to bigger and better exams. Uh, and maybe you go to university and learn more sophisticated versions of second stage thinking, but it is still second stage thinking. And if you get a good degree at the end, you get a good job. If you start solving problems in the organization that you walk into, uh, then you get promoted. Uh, and if you do really well, you get promoted really high. Uh, chief execs, senior staff across an organization, typically exceptionally good at second stage thinking. And second stage thinking is brilliant at generating useful ideas. And if all you ever want is useful ideas, and organizations typically run on useful ideas, that is brilliant. We need useful ideas. Useful ideas help an organization progress day by day, minute by minute, you need useful ideas. Um, and so second stage thinking is great and it drives the continuous improvement process. Uh, and if you're familiar with left and right brain thinking, a very simplistic view of the brain here, but if you look at left and right hand side of the brain, the left hand side of the brain factually has a very high density of very short, rapid firing neural networks. It is brilliant for processing information and it is really, really quick. And, and because of that, it's like a tightly wired computer. And as soon as it starts receiving information, it kind of lights up and starts whirring into, into, into motion. The more information it has, the more it's exercising. And as soon as it's processed all the information, bang, it delivers the answers. It is really, really quick. And it is perfect for second stage thinking because it processes information. And if all you want is continuous improvement, stay with left brain thinking. Organizations are driven by left brain thinkers. Left brain thinkers get promoted. Left brain thinkers run our organizations. Really, really powerful. And if all you want is continuous improvement, great. But if you want step change, if you want discontinuous improvement, you need some first stage thinking, which involves the right hand side of the brain, which has a much lesser density of much longer, less connected neural networks. It is brilliant for making new connections, but it is horribly, horribly slow. So slow, left hand side of the brain gets bored waiting for it and therefore rushes in and solves the problem for you, which is why useful kills novel. And if you look at this here, then if you look at kind of the different sides, you have the left hand side, which is qu phenomenally quick at generating useful ideas. The right hand side of the brain is phenomenally slow, but excellent at generating novelty. And so what we need to do is we need to learn how to turn off from time to time the left-hand side of the brain. Because if we don't turn off the left-hand side of the brain, then it will always dominate proceedings and useful will always get there first. What we need is a systematic approach to, to challenging that. And let me demonstrate what the impact of this by giving you an example. Um, suppose we've got an example here. Suppose we've got a uh, football tournament. Uh, it's a simple knockout tournament. Um, there are no home and away stuff and all the league stuff in the early stages. It's a straight knockout tournament of football. There are 145 teams in the tournament. Um, I have a very simple question for you. Um, given that if there's a draw at the end of full time, you have extra time at the end of extra time, you've got penalties. 145 teams in a knockout tournament. Here's my question. How many games, how many matches are played through to and including the final? Simple as that. Let me just give you a couple of seconds to give it a thought. Just, just, Consider what you're thinking as you try and solve the problem. Now, the majority of people uh, leap into second stage thinking. In fact, we all leap into second stage thinking. The majority of people use this particular mechanism for it uh, because we've got, a, we've got a system for this. We've got a mechanism or a process we're going to apply to the data here. Uh, we know there's a halving and halving and halving and halving process, and all we have to do is to put the 145 teams uh, into this process. Uh, and out will come the answer. We know that. Um, we instantly kind of get scuppered because, damn it, it's an odd number. We can't halve it. And I've had people tell me you can't have a knockout tournament with an odd number of contestants, which is just blatantly not true. Because what you do is you have a buy in the system. So someone has a walk through the first round without playing a game. Um, so, so brilliant. All of a sudden, you know how to you go, all ah, right, fine. So now I can go back to the beginning and now. So we'll call it 146, but one of them's a buy, and we'll follow through. Uh, even numbers all the way through, the half and half, you will quickly, really quickly get to, because half 146 is going to be 73, for goodness sake, that's another odd number. Um, so you sit there and go, oh, for goodness sake, I don't know how to solve this. Um, then you think, oh, well, there's more than one buy. So you're all the way around the loop again and say, right, fine, there's now more than one buy. I need to put, work out how many buys there are. Difficult. So what you do is you start guessing. 
And so you start guessing more or less and you're working through. And eventually, you will eventually bail out. And when you bail out, what you'll do is you'll get put an approximation in place. I did this not that long ago with someone. And someone said, um, they said yeah, 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 yeah. Um, they went through it and they went very quiet. And they said, well, I don't know what it is. It must be, what is it, quite a big number, about 75? 75 was just a random number guessed. Uh, they knew it was wrong. They just wanted to be in the, roughly the right ballpark. And this is what happens in our organizations. If we're solving a problem, we typically use second stage thinking. We try and solve the problem using a process. If the process doesn't work, you go back and you try harder. If it doesn't work, you back and try harder. If it doesn't work again, you go back and try harder. And eventually, time pressures will win out. What you'll do is partially solve the problem with something that really doesn't make the problem go away. You'll bail out, put an approximation in place, and then put a series of workarounds inside that will compensate for the fact you can't solve the problem properly. And these workarounds cost money, and they stifle agility, and they take time. And, and our organizations are riddled with examples where we, you know what, we can't quite solve that problem, but we've got a workaround in place that addresses it. Uh, when I was in manufacturing, when I was manufacturing director, we had lots of guys and ladies on the shop floor, safety engineers. Uh, we did lots of overtime. There was a simple system. Uh, at the end of every month or towards the end of every month, 21st of, the, uh, of every month, if you submit your timesheet, you would get paid for the last four weeks or last month's worth of time of overtime. Uh, and it would run by the payroll and it would be in your bank account on the 28th. Submit your timesheet on the 21st. Jobs are good and you get paid on the 28th. Dead, dead simple. 200 safety engineers. You try and get 200 safety engineers to submit their timesheets on time. Never happen. Uh, there was always a dribble of people up to kind of complaining to payroll and saying, I'm, I, I, I've missed my timesheet day, but I need to be paid. What can you do for me? They say, oh, for goodness sake, there's a system. Just follow the system, for goodness sake. They go, oh, yes, I know, I know. It's like Johnny's birthday, and I missed the date for whatever reason, the dog ate the cat or something. I don't know. There's a whole bunch of things that why I couldn't do. It's hard. Uh, there were always these people, every single, always different people every single month. And payroll eventually roll their eyes and go, oh, for goodness sake, we'll put it through manually. There you go. There's the manual workaround. That's compensating for the fact that you can't get everyone to do it properly. And our organizations are soggy and we are stifled with these workarounds and their consequences of second stage thinking. The trick here is to recognize when second stage thinking isn't working, stop doing second stage thinking. Start again. Explore the problem before you understand, before you try and solve it. And third stage thinking is nothing to do with solving the problem, everything to do with understanding it. And we typically don't do it. What we do is we rush in and solve the problem before we understand it, then wonder why we haven't really fixed the problem. I want to ask you two questions about this problem that are nothing to do with solving it, everything to do with understanding it. And then when we've done that, I promise you, we will collectively solve the problem just like that. Here we go. First question, how many losers are there in total in the entire tournament? Remember, we've got 145 teams in the tournament. How many losers are there in the entire tournament? deceptively simple. Some of you are going to go, oh, this sounds simple, but I must be being tricked. No, no, dead simple question. 144 losers. You've got 145 teams, 144 of them must lose because then they go out. Second simple question, how many losers are there for every game played? Again, horribly simple question. So simple, again, that you'll hold back and go, oh, I'm being tricked, so I need to think about this again. There's a trick in here somewhere. No, no, no. The original approach was complicated. This is simple. The number of losers per game, simple, one. Now, here's the killer. If there are 144 teams that lose in the entire tournament and there's one loser for every game played, how many games are played in the entire tournament? And again, horribly simple in its logic. If there are 144 losers and there's one loser for every game, there must be 144 games played in the entire tournament. If you have any knockout tournament with N contestants, there are always N minus one losers. Therefore, there must always be N minus one games played. It is dead straightforward. So, so, so straightforward. You go, no, 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 no. The original second stage was really quite complicated with this, going through this. I was going through this process. I, I don't know. In fact, I still don't know how many buys there are. So how on earth can I solve the problem if I don't know how many buys? There was nothing to do with the number of buys in the question. The question was all about how many games are played. And it's a simple n minus one equation. Consider it. If you've got four teams in a knockout tournament, test it. Four teams in a knockout tournament, that's two semifinals and a final. That's three games. Has to work every single time. How elegant is this? All we've done is taken time to understand the problem before we rush through and solve it. We've given the right, right hand side of the brain time to breathe before the left hand side crunches the problem. And what we have to do is to systematically learn to turn off that left hand side of the brain, to give our right side 
time to breathe. Now, if we don't do this, all we're doing is condemning ourselves to a world of second stage thinking. The second stage thinking is fine. If all you want is useful ideas, stay rushing in and solving problems and generating useful ideas with the left brain. Keep the right side of the brain kind of in its box and people can use it at home, but don't use it at work. But if you want to drive creativity, if you want to challenge the way you're doing things, you must first understand the problem as deeply as possible before you can then achieve the step change. For that, we need first stage thinking. So for creativity, we must turn off the left brain to give the right side time to breathe. Now, this isn't fair because this is, this is not typical of your business issue. So as a worked example, cool, but not relevant. And the reason it's not relevant is it's a puzzle, quite frankly, because there is a single unique correct answer. And because there's a single unique correct answer, we call it a puzzle. Your issues are more complicated than this. Uh, whatever the spread is, if you've got rubbish ideas at one end of the scale and brilliant ideas at the top, and this is my kind of graph, and you've got a number of ideas on the side, your graph will look something like this. You'll have very, very few brilliant ideas available to you. You'll have overwhelming numbers of rubbish ideas. And we're very good at cutting off the rubbish ideas. We can filter those out. We're good at that through our experience. But we're rubbish at accessing brilliant because we rush in and solve the problem before we understand it. And what we do effectively is condemn ourselves to using this space here where we generate useful ideas. And the quicker we rush in and solve a problem, the quicker we rush into solving it, allow the left brain time to get straight into it and spit out the answer, the more we push this back towards the rubbish end of the scale. And we're getting worse and worse solutions, more and more compromises. If we want to truly drive the creative process, we need to learn to turn off the left-hand side of the brain to give the right-hand side time to breathe. And if we don't do that, we're condemning ourselves to a life of continuous improvement, which is brilliant, but not good enough. And it certainly will stifle innovation. Hopefully this is all making sense. First block. Second block to creativity, this thing, this thing called patterning systems. I've said it before. I said we make sense of our worlds by looking backwards, and we do. Um, and we do it through pattern matching. Um, it's as if inside our heads what we're doing is we've got, we've got a brain that's crammed full of patterns. Um, and, and what we're doing is looking at our patterns from our past and superimposing them on today's situation to help us understand what's going on. Based on that understanding, we then project forward how we need to behave in the future. So we use pattern matching from our past to sanitize and understand what's happening here. And then based on that, we then project forward. And that's how we work. Um, it's as if inside our brains, we have enormous virtual filing cabinet. And inside this virtual filing cabinet, beautifully filed, beautifully indexed, there are patterns for everything we have ever, ever, ever come across. Through any of our senses, anything we've ever been taught through the education system, anything we've ever experienced and made sense of, uh, anything we've ever seen, anything that's come through subliminally even, we've got patterns for everything we have ever, ever, ever come across. And it's beautifully filed, beautifully indexed. This is kind of an interesting convergent space. This is where creativity and innovation meet NLP, neuro-linguistic programming. Uh, you've got hypnotherapy in here, cognitive behavior therapy. It's all based around this filing cabinet model, if you think about it. So just imagine inside your head, you have an enormous virtual filing cabinet. And what you're doing constantly through your subconscious is flicking through that filing cabinet to try and find patterns that help you make sense of what's happening around you. So whilst you're listening to this, this webinar, you're looking at the screen, all your conscious effort is the screen and listening to me speak, hopefully. Um, what you're doing through your peripheral vision, just consider for a second, as you stare at the screen and your peripheral vision around your desk, in your office area, out of the windows, you're going to see a vast amount of further information. You're not paying any attention to it, but your brain is making sense of it. And that's the subliminal pattern matching. If there's anything in that peripheral vision, and I'm only looking at one sense here, if there's anything in that peripheral vision that you think is weird and you don't have a pattern for, your subconscious taps your conscious on the shoulder and says, hang on, can I just make sense of this, please? Your consciousness is diverted away, you make sense of it, and then cast it into the filing cabinet, now you're back okay again. It's a fight or flight thing, hugely powerful technique, because uh, we do this pattern matching really quickly. And we do it with problem solving. If we're going to solve a problem, what we do is we do pattern matching. So what we're doing here, uh, we've got these, these two images here, one on the left, one on the right, are made up of black blobs of information. It's kind of a metaphor, a visual metaphor for problem solving. So as I explain the problem on the, on the uh, left to you, what I do is I give you the black blobs of information. Uh, and what you do is you build up a pattern of those black blobs, and whilst you're doing it, you're filtering through your filing cabinet 
to see if you can find a pattern match. See if you can find anything that makes sense of that. You can't solve my problem. You're listening to me in a puzzled way. You know, I can't, I can't make sense of this. The reason you can't make sense of it is you don't have a pattern match. And eventually you pull out a pattern and go, ah, I can see it. And, and, and the aha moment is a really powerful thing. Uh, we, have a, um, we are so dependent on pattern matching uh, that we have a reward mechanism built into this. And what happens when you do a pattern match, your brain goes, oh, well done you, and gives you a little squirt of the hormone dopamine. And dopamine is the feel-good hormone that makes you, gives you um, gives that feel-good factor. It makes your pupils dilate. Uh, it makes your face brighten up. It gives you, it's often connected to your vocal cords. And you, uh, the aha moment is literally the moment in which you get the, the feel-good hormone, dopamine, mm, is injected. Lasts about a millisecond. do not last long. Passes. But nevertheless, you get occasionally a physical jerk as well. So if you can solve it, what it means is you'll know, you, you, don't, you don't want me to continue explaining the problem because you've got a pattern that matches and you are already applying that pattern and working out what to do next. Now, the image on the left is probably the easier of these two. I reckon normally 25% of people can see the one on the left and less than 10%, less than 5% can see the one on the right. Similar issue though, I've given you lots of black blobs. There is a problem there, there's a pattern there, there's a crystal clear image in there and you're trying to find it. You cannot understand my problem until you do a pattern match. When you do a pattern match, bang, all of a sudden it's crystal clear. You know what to do next. And that's how this metaphor works. So just have a look at those two images, which you have been doing as I've been talking because you've been distracted. Your subconscious has been saying, well, don't listen to Dave. Just try and work out what those patterns are. So we've got two patterns here. We've got one here. Uh, the image we've got here um, is often referred to as a, a man's face. It's often a Jesus-type figure, kind of Last Supper. Uh, someone said years ago, Jesus playing a guitar, which is kind of a bizarre expression. And you look at it and go, mm, maybe so. Um, uh, che Guevara is often seen in this image as well. It's kind of a man's face, bearded man's face, uh, shoulders down to the kind of middle of the chest. Um, uh, occasionally you get, you get a George Harrison's kind of Frank Zappa-ish type character there. So a number of people will be able to see that one there. If you look at the one on the right-hand side, this one's more complicated. And here's my question. Can anyone see a cowboy on a horse? Have a look at it. Cowboy on a horse, before I give you the proper interpretation. Now, if you can't see it, doesn't mean anything about your creativity at all. All it means is you haven't done the pattern match yet. You haven't got the pattern match from your filing cabinet that allows you to solve it. Don't worry about that. It doesn't mean you're not creative. All it means is you haven't found the pattern match yet. Um, and I'll put you out of your misery. We also have some therapy available on the idea set to put people right at the end of all this stuff and rest easy. Um, so cowboy on a horse. People can often see a dog on the right-hand side, and that's born out of frustration. What you do is, is you're rather irritably fingering through the filing cabinet you have the dog section of your filing cabinet because that has black and white in it because Dalmatians are black and white. So you often get dog scene and you get cows because they're very black and white in most circumstances. Uh, you also get panda. I had three pandas found in this image in recent times. Um, but that's not really this cab on a horse. Let me put you out of your misery. Here's the image. Uh, so hopefully you can see the cowboy on the horse and hopefully you can see the figure's face. And if I go back, hopefully you can see the two together. So if I do them quite quickly, there we go. So hopefully you can see the two. So hopefully you can see the two images now. So, and when you can see them, and people often say with the cowboy on the horse, I couldn't see it until you said it. But as soon as you said it, and all I did was point at the folder in your filing cabinet, as soon as I say it, back comes into view. And you get that, the aha moment, which is that dopamine belt. Um, so let's have a look at this. I mean, so what? So now you can help me solve the problem because you've got a pattern match. Now have a look at this. Here's the cowboy on the horse. Um, notice the information here is not, not complete. There are huge gaps in this. I don't know all the information about the problem. If I'm explaining a problem to you, there are bound to be gaps in it. Because if, if, if it was gapless, then I'd probably be able to solve the problem. But I can't because there are bits missing. Uh, so we've got lots of scant information. As soon as you do the pattern match, though, what your brain does is it fills in the gaps. So you can now see perfectly the outline of the cowboy and the horse. Uh, you get rid of all the other rubbish around the outside. You can see it crystal clear. Your brain fills in the gaps. Notice there isn't enough information here to tell the sex of the rider, let alone the career choice. And yet we can all see it as a cowboy on a horse. Occasionally someone will say, no, 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 that hat's too big. That hat's far too big. It must be a Mexican. So what we're doing now is we're debating the nationality of the rider on the horse. And someone will say, yeah, 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 it's definitely a Mexican because he's riding a Palomino horse, for, for goodness sake. Um, or a piebald horse, not Palomino, for goodness sake. It's a piebald horse. And someone will say, yeah, it's a piebald horse. Crazy. We now know the, we now know the breeding line of the horse the sex, the nationality, and the career choice of the rider. That's how confident we are because of our pattern match that we understand this image. That's what happens to us in the real world. We do a pattern match, and as soon as we've got a pattern match, we take our past experience and force it onto our current situation. And with absolute confidence, 
we then decide how to behave in the future because we've got a pattern match. Notice, stuff that doesn't match, we can handle this. This information here, nothing to do with the cowboy and the horse. This information here has nothing to do with the cowboy and the horse or up here. What our brain does rather conveniently is takes information that doesn't fit the pattern match, airbrush it out. So it's as if it didn't exist because all we can see is the cowboy and the horse with some stuff in the background. That's what happens in the real world. You take a pattern from your past, you superimpose it on today's situation, you persuade yourself you know it fantastically intimately well. And based on that assumption, you then project forward what your behavior should be in the future. And we do it all the time. And it's why we build in this inertia. And organizations have patterns for how we do things around here. And look, this patterning is um, absolutely rough. We could not function without this patterning. It's a great, great attribute. We couldn't exist without it as a high order being that we are. However, major block when it comes to creativity. Um, you go back to your first day in any organization, uh, okay, how senior you are, day one in any organization is uncomfortable. And the reason it's uncomfortable is we don't have a pattern for how we do things around here. It's my first day at HFL, a drug testing company. I didn't have any background in forensic sciences. This was a weird feeling. I was uncomfortable. I had no background. The fact I got no background was simply that it meant I had no patterns. Um, and so we sit there in reception waiting to be picked up, and I, I didn't know anyone that I bumped into, so I had no patterns for any of them. I looked at stuff in the laboratory. I didn't know what they were doing. I've got no patterns for that stuff. Even the office areas, I had no patterns. I didn't, in fact, I didn't know where lunch was going to come from. I have no pattern for how to, how to function. I didn't know where the toilets were. Uh, so I've got no pattern. It's uncomfortable. Day one in any, any new organization, however senior you are, is uncomfortable. Really uncomfortable. And as we go on, at the end of the first week, I get the basics. At least I know where the toilets are on my desk. I know those basics. I know what's going to happen at lunchtime. I've got a pattern for that stuff. I'm beginning to work out what's happening in the offices. Um, people I bump into, I begin to, I don't talk about customers and suppliers yet, but I, I'm getting it together. It takes what, six to eight months? Maybe before you're really, really comfortable in an organization. And by being really comfortable, what it means is you have a pattern for how we do things around here. As the cowboy on the horse is effectively a metaphor for how we do things around here. And don't be surprised that the pattern you have in your head for how we do things around here, brackets, cowboy on the horse, will be identical to the patterns for everyone who works in that organization because they help you shape your pattern of your understanding of how we do things around here. So everyone ends up with a, with a common model and everything is then interpreted through that common model. Now, someone like me pops up and say, well, hang on, we need to do things differently. We need to, we need to be creative and innovative. We want to step change. We want to, I don't want more of the same. I don't want to be trapped in convention and tradition, old model, cowboy on a horse. I want something different. I want some creativity and innovation. And that's like me saying to you, I'd like you to stop seeing the cowboy on the horse. Now, you watch how difficult it is. The vast majority of you had no difficulty with this five minutes ago. When we had the cowboy on the horse image up there first, you could not see the cowboy on the horse. I'm now going to put the slide back up again. I'd like you to replicate that feeling of five minutes ago when you couldn't see the cowboy on the horse, because then you're liberated. You can now look at things completely differently. You want me to look at things differently? I'd, fine, I'll just get rid of the cowboy on the horse, and all of a sudden I can see things differently. You watch how difficult this is. I'm going to put this slide back up. I want you to replicate what you had five minutes ago when you couldn't see the cowboy on the horse. So I want you not to see the cowboy on the horse with this image. Good luck with this one. We are innate patterning systems. This is going to be hard work. You ready? You've only been exposed to this image for, what, three minutes, maybe? In your organization, you've been exposed to the pattern for how we do things around here for an awful lot longer than this. So this ought to be an easy task. Don't see the cowboy on the horse, but you must look at the screen. You ready? Here we go. Now, I don't care who you are. First thing you do, you look at the cowboy on the horse. I mean, yes, there's some other stuff in there. There's a witch's face in there. You can see that there's a nose and a chin like that must be a witch. That's a patterning trait, by the way. In my pattern, I've seen too many Wizard of Oz's in my time. Got a face like that, must be a witch. That's a patterning behavior. All of a sudden, I'm being conditioned. And it happens all the time. You cannot not see the cowboy on the horse. And yet we tell people in our organization to be creative and innovative. What we have to do is take the patterns that are locked in there and make them unfamiliar. And that's how creativity techniques work. What they do is they take something you're very familiar with and they make you unfamiliar with it. And that's a key aspect of the creative process. You make the familiar unfamiliar and it's uncomfortable because it's reverting to day one as you sat in reception, not understanding what's happening in your organization. And if you're not comfortable with these techniques, not a problem, don't do them. Stay in the world of continuous improvement and forget step change. Because this stuff is all about driving step change. Now, if you don't want to do it, it's uncomfortable, it's difficult. Of course, it's all those things. You have to get over it, quite frankly. This is a senior management responsibility to drive step change in an organization. This is about fundamentally thinking differently. 
Um, let me give you one more of these images. Just see what, see if you can see what this is. Just last one of this type. Uh, see if you can see what this is an image of. Crystal clear. I promise you, this image is crystal clear. Have a look at this. Can anyone see what it is? If you can't see it, brilliant. You're being creative. If you can see it, don't shout out. I normally say in an open forum. That's not really matter if you do. Um, here's the answer to the question. Can anyone see a cow on a horse upside down? All I've done is taken the previous image and rotated it through 180 degrees. There's the cowboy's hat, there's the horse's head, there's the tail, there's the legs. But we don't have a pattern in our head for a cowboy on a horse upside down. So all of a sudden you're liberated. Now you can look at this image, you know it's cowboy on a horse upside down, but it's not familiar, so it's not locking you in. And all of a sudden you're liberated. That's how these creative problem solving techniques work. They make the familiar unfamiliar. They make you childlike in your understanding. You gotta hold on to it. And children are absolutely key in this because children have stunning imaginations. Uh, they have no problem um, suspending judgment. First stage of creativity is generating an idea that's novel and useless. Uh, we're hopeless at that because we don't like useless. And we actually don't like novel because we don't have a pattern for it. Children have no difficulty with this because if you think about it, um, children don't have, uh, don't have the, the patterns in their head to give them their judgment. Um, when we come into this world, we come into this world with an empty filing cabinet. Um, we have no difficulty with novel because everything is new. But the, the more we grow up, the more patterns we put in the filing cabinet. So we come in when we're young, novelty is easy. Um, useful is difficult because we don't have the patterns to give us useful. By the time you get to our age, and certainly my age, uh, we've got a jam-packed filing cabinet. Novel, really difficult because I've got patterns that more or less fit many things. And so I'll superimpose them and convince myself I'm an expert. And I'm hopeless when it comes to uh, novel, but I'm brilliant when it comes to useful because I've got a full filing cabinet. So this intermediate impossible, novel and useless, children have no difficulty with it. Their imagination is stunning. Um, there was a, there's a thing called the Torrance test for creativity. Um, it's independent of age. And um, the Torrance test tests an individual's creativity. And what it shows is at the age of four, more than 98% of children are deemed as being genius level at creativity. Not just good at creativity, genius level at creativity at the age of four. At the age of 10, that goes down to 34%. And what you're seeing here is the effect of primary schooling on our children's creativity. Because what they're doing is piling stuff into the filing cabinet. They're creating useful whilst they destroy novel. By the age of 17, that drops down to 11%. Sad fact is, what we do at best is recruit these, and what we should be doing is recruiting these. Or better, maybe we should be taking these, the best of them, and teach them how to do this. And that's how these creativity techniques work. What we're doing is simulating the childlike thinking of a four-year-old in order to liberate our thinking from the constraints of a, of a jam-packed filing cabinet. Because all we're seeing here is the filing cabinet that's being filled up. Now, the techniques, weird and wonderful. Um, techniques are all over the place. There's a small cross-section of the various techniques shown here. Um, and they all involve making the familiar unfamiliar. They all involve playing with the left-hand side and right-hand side, liberating the right-hand side of the brain. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them at all, but what we do in the Idea Centre is we help people understand how the techniques work. Uh, we train people up to be expert facilitators, and we then give you a structure for implementing it and embedding it in your organisation so you can do it for yourselves at will. Um, we've got Lego down here. Lego is an interesting technique. Um, there is a website called seriousplay.com. Uh, if you go to seriousplay.com, it is a website owned by Lego. Uh, and what they do is they sell Lego kits to businesses for creative problem solving. And it works like this. If you've got a problem, whatever your problem, I don't care what the nature of your business problem is, pull Lego out in front of you. Try and make a model of your problem out of Lego. Whatever it is, it's a bizarre thing to watch happen because someone looks at the Lego and looks at you and then looks at the Lego and looks at you and goes, this is bonkers. I'm a grown adult messing around with Lego. Get over it. As soon as you start putting the bits together, you forget the Lego. All of a sudden, what you're doing and what you see is the buildup of your problem out of your head. You're taking an abstract thought from your head and you're producing a tangible three-dimensional representation of it. And as you build it, it becomes clearer and clearer. And anyone looking at your model now understands your problem in a way they will never get by looking inside your head because they can't get there. The Lego is a brilliant tool for articulating problems. Uh, once you've made the problem, what you then do is stay in Lego land and imagine what you would do in Lego to fix the problem. So you mess around with the Lego, you say, there's a model of my problem, take a photograph of it. Now modify it to solve the problem, there you go, that's the problem solved, take a photograph of it. What you've done to get from one to the other 
is simply a metaphor for what you need to do in real life. Hugely powerful, transformative stuff. There are examples on the website, the Idea Center website, and in the app, uh, which show you how this works. Phenomenally powerful technique. Start to finish, 20 minutes. Uh, there's an organization in North London uh, now that uh, Anders Electronics that uh, uses Lego as a, an interview tool. Uh, if you're being interviewed by Anders Electronics, it's a serious display technology company. What they'll do is they'll, uh, if they look like they like you, you're a likely candidate, what they'll do is pour Lego out on, in front of you and say, right, fine, I'm, I as the interviewer, I'm going to stand out for 10 minutes and step away. While I'm away, I'd like you to make a model out of Lego that represents what you'll do for this business if you're successful and get the job. And that's kind of the expression you get where, where the, the interview, interviewee goes, really, you're really going to do that? What? And I stand up and walk out and think, oh, you've done it. Um, occasionally, the candidate stands up, gets their coat, walks out, freaked out by the whole process. And what Anders says, that's absolutely brilliant. We don't want to employ people who can't do the Lego test. I come back 10 minutes later, you explain your model to me. Absolutely brilliant. Because now we've got something we can look at and articulate. It's always a good experience. It gives us a model to explore. Um, what I then do is take a photograph of the Lego model. And if you're successful and get the job, waiting for you on your first day at your desk is a framed photograph of the Lego model that you made in your interview. And here's the killer bit, just in case you ever forget what you promised to do for this business. How cool is this? So all around the walls of these office areas, there's photographs of Lego models. Now, you're going out for that interview. Someone bumps into you and says, well, how was your interview? You're not going to say, oh, it was all right. You're going to say, you never guess what they did. They got Lego and now I get to this, that and the other. What you're now doing is selling the creativity of my business, despite the fact you don't even work for me yet. How cool is this as a technique? Now, brainstorming is also down here. Um, brainstorming technique, um, quite common as a, a, as a creative problem solver. Well, they call it creative problem solving, creative problem solving. Remember, uh, we define um, creativity as generating ideas that are novel and useful. Brainstorming sessions are not creative. What you tend to do in a brainstorming session is list useful ideas. Anyone generates novelty, they're weird. You give them that look that tells them to shut up or at least conform to the cowboy on the horse and at least brainstorm sensible, useful ideas. And what we do then is we look at our long list and pick the best of them. And that's the best of the continuous improvement ideas. Super, if all you want to do is drive useful. But if you want novelty, you need something completely different. And my antidote to brainstorming is a technique called superheroes. Uh, we got a deck of cards, and each card has written on it the definition of a different superhero. Uh, and if we're going to do a, a session, problem-solving session with superheroes, I hand out the cards, you read the cards. Um, so each person has one superhero. You have to become that superhero. So you internalize, if you're Spider-Man, you are Spider-Man. If you're Wonder Woman, Magic Bracelets, Lasso of Truth, you're away. That's who you are. And what we do then is we brainstorm solutions to the problem in the style of your superhero. It guarantees every single idea that you generate will be novel and useless. Critical first stage of creativity. What we then do is pick the most outrageous of those techniques. Give you a sneak preview of where this is going. You then pick the most outrageous of those ideas, novel and useless, grab hold of it and understand how it works and then try and generate a useful idea that has the same attributes. Bingo, you've got a novel and useful idea. This is a really, really powerful technique. And there are a whole raft of organizations that are now adopting this. I walked into one in Cambridge not that long ago. You walk into a meeting room, in the corner of the room, they've got a running rail and on the running rail, they've got the outfits of the superheroes. People dress up as the superheroes now because they know if you hold the superheroes card, you'll brainstorm in a novel and useless way. If you're dressed up as Wonder Woman, for goodness sake, then you really do become Wonder Woman and you generate outrageous ideas. This is a phenomenally powerful technique. People would only do this if they knew for certain that the techniques worked. And what we do at the Idea Center is we teach people a whole raft of these different techniques. What I've got here, just to give it some credibility, because this sounds dangerously close to frivolous, which it absolutely is not. None of these techniques take longer than 60 minutes from start to finish. None of them take more than 60 minutes. Don't go off, off site. Uh, don't rent expensive country homes for residential weekends. Don't bother hugging trees unless you want to. Um, these techniques are serious inside the business. You brainstorm as a superhero for about 10 minutes. Rest of the time is then converging it back and making it useful. This is a tiny cross-section of the type of problems that we've uh, addressed at HFL. Over the years, we must have done anywhere between 150 and 200 different issues, all of them hugely serious, all of them great fun as problem-solving exercises, and they cumulatively transform the business. That's what this stuff is about. You choose where you want to play, and you then put the techniques in behind them. 
Simple definitions to hang on to. Creativity, generation of ideas that are both novel and useful. Simple definition. Innovation, making money slash adding value out of creativity. It's the implementation doing thing. Creativity is the thinking thing. Innovation is the following up and doing thing. Doing it effectively though. Just doing it badly and losing money, not innovation. Simple definitions. Now, if you want to find out more, um, there's a whole raft of these techniques and we run idea centers all around the country, which are on martial arts for creativity where we have regular sessions. So we've got them in Birmingham and Manchester, in uh, London, we've got them in Cambridge, we've got them in Bournemouth, we've got them all over the place. Uh, we're opening one in Scotland. If anyone's interested, visit the website, uh, have a look at the events, get in contact with me, uh, feel free to do that, drop me an email. Um, if you download the app, uh, it, we've got an app that fits iOS and Android, uh, download the app. There's a whole bunch of the supporting videos that explains all this stuff. You can also subscribe to techniques, the how-to techniques. Um, on the website, we've got all the events, uh, where they are in the country. Uh, and if you're more generically interested, just drop me an email, get in contact. It would be an absolute pleasure to come back to you um, and hopefully take this forward. And if you want to try some of these techniques, my urging is just do it. These techniques are fantastic and transformative. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and hopefully... A useful session um, as I, I can only stress if you have any interest in finding out more please do not hesitate to contact me thank you very very much indeed for your attention